this then. Hi, everybody. Welcome to UNT Alumni Live. I am Claudia Taylor with the UNT Alumni Association. And today we are on site at True Leaf Studio in Denton, owned by UNT alumni Taylor and Michael Bales. They'll be showing us around their incredible nursery space, answering your questions about how to keep our plants thriving, and showing us all the fun activities and features that make True Leaf 100% unique. Before we get started, just a few reminders. If you're joining us on Zoom, please keep an eye on the chat function at the bottom of your screen. I'll be dropping some useful links there, and you can also use that to ask questions for uh, the True Leaf crew. I'll also post a link to a survey there. As always, fill that out and you'll be entered to win a UNT prize pack. If you're watching on Facebook, you can also leave us your questions in the comments section there, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. And we're also doing something special today. Next time you stop in at True Leaf Studio, you can mention the code UNT Alumni for 10% off your order just for being here today. Now, before I hand it over to my colleague, Casey Kamininski, let me tell you a bit about our guests today, Taylor and Michael Bales. Taylor and Michael met at UNT with Taylor graduating in 2009 with a degree in English literature and Michael graduating in 2012 with a degree in studio art. Michael pursued a career as a tattoo artist, quickly becoming well-known and in demand for his floral and black and gray designs. And Taylor taught and coached volleyball, basketball, and track in Argyle ISD. Last spring, they took their love of plants and turned it into True Leaf Studio, a thriving nursery and event space just off Denton's downtown square. In addition to their retail shop, the couple have plans as COVID restrictions lift to expand events like happy hours, corporate team building, bridal showers, and more to bring a little bit of plant love to everyone in Denton. Taylor and Michael, thanks so much for being here today with us. And Casey, take it away. Hello, and thank you again, guys. Thank you, Taylor and Michael, for being here. As Claudia mentioned uh, in her introduction there, you guys met at UNT. So that's a pretty special story. Do you, would you guys be willing to share a little bit of this love story with us? Yeah, we um, tell people that we met in high school because we were graduating in high school. So we weren't exactly high school sweethearts, but we can kind of say we've been together since high school because we graduated right as we got together. So yeah, yeah, it's well, too long, frankly, is our joke with people. Yeah, it's been, we've been together entirely too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> relate to that. So I need you two to behave today just for the next 45 minutes. Get through this. You can do this. We'll try. Yeah. We'll try. No problem. Well, what drew you to UNT? You? Right. Me. So my, we grew up in Flower Mound. My family's always been from the area. I wanted to go to college close to home, but not too close to home. So Denton felt pretty good. And, um, we used to come up all the time for music events and food and things to do because there it was there was not a whole lot in Flower Mound, and uh, so I liked the culture of it more than anything. And then once I started going to school, I kind of I've always loved to read. I've been a huge reader, so my path just sort of naturally went towards literature and teaching and that sort of thing. Um, I went here more for the culture than anything. Yeah, same music and art, and it was so close. We were like, yeah. it's kind of a no-brainer for both of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. It's a, it's a fantastic place to be, and I'm so glad you guys made that choice. So, all right, tell us a little bit about where you're sitting right now and uh, what this environment's like and why you're in this space right now. Well, our building is a 100-year-old service station. So we'll start there. Um, it's one of the oldest buildings in Denton, as far as we can find back on tax records and things like that. Um, this space is sort of the, what we call the workshop room. There's kind of two sections to the building. There's like the, what used to be the bays. Um, so it's just a big open white room that we use for a lot of different things. Um, and then the front room is like mainly the retail area where we have the terrarium bar and that kind of thing. That's what you first walk into. Um, we're also sitting in what is Michael's private studio during the week. So when he does have a client back here, it's just kind of closed off. It's private. Um, but yeah, we, his area. We like to joke with my clients cause it's, it's really nice and cleaned up and pretty in here now, but we like to joke that they got tattooed in a garage. And so that joke goes over well sometimes and others <laughs> not so well, but it's fun cause it, um, it has that old building feel, but it's a big open white studio. You might as well, you know, feel like you're in some loft in New York or something. It's, it feels really cool when you're in here. The light's really good. And mm -hmm. It's a fun place to work. Yeah. Yeah. 
I love it. Well, that's awesome. Well, guys, the plant questions are already rolling in. That's so right. we're going to jump right to it. I knew there would be so many, especially after the storm we had in February. And, right. you know, people have taken up a new hobby through through this COVID pandemic situation. And, and plants are just the hottest thing. Right Gangbusters. Now, right? Gangbusters. Yeah. Holy, holy. Yeah. Holy. Oh my gosh. So, all right. The very first question we have, oh gosh, Claudia, I just lost my screen that you sent me here. See, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm failing. I'm failing. Hold on. What what is, what, okay, here we go. I can ask. Yeah. What is the most popular plant that you sell there? That's a tough one because we go through plants like water around here. I would say the pothos and philodendron family, you know, like if you want to talk families, but um, they're the most expansive. There's so many choices, so many options, sizes, all that kind of stuff. So I would say far and away those two. Um, in those two families, it's going to be, you know, your monsteras and your cordatums and the brazils and those ladies. And then in the pothos, it's primarily, you know, gold, neon, enjoy, marble queen, those we get a few silver satins and exoticas and some of the more rare ones um you know the, the cebu blues and those but they're not as plentiful so we sometimes keep those back for collectors when someone comes in and says okay what can't i kill we're like i'm over here <laughs> we're over here and we direct them to snake plants and pop those because those you know when you want big leafy foliage but you're new to plants it's a good place to start just to like have instant greenery and you're not going to kill it probably. Most likely. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. So you guys just used a lot of words that I've either never heard before <laughs> or have no idea what they are. And I'm a visual learner. Sure. So I'm going to need some visual assistance here. Can you guys show us around and show us what you have in stock right now? Sure. Yeah, sure. You want to go on a tour? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll follow you. Oh, Lord. Come on with it then. So. Over here are some of our big mamas. We keep these in stock because we do rent out this studio space for photography. So people need to have things for backdrops, for product shoots, or for um, you know bridles and stuff. We do a lot of that. So some of these big mamas that are so eye-catching and huge are not necessarily for sale, but for gawking. So these are monsteras. This is a philodendron. And I don't know, good? So. Back here in this area, you know, we've got like big fiddle. This area is slowly progressing as soon as, you know, it's not all covid -y out anymore. We'll be able to do a lot more events and, and workshops back in here. But back in here, we have the table set up. We do see starting classes and um, microgreen classes and things like that, too, that are kind of on the docket for coming up. In the meantime, they're just kind of staged for plants and that sort of thing. So we've got everything from spider plants. This is the Brazil. We've got some prayer plants. These are our go-to pothos. So like this is golden pothos. This is neon. That's enjoy. So most often people tend to find a plant family or two that they really know how to take care of it and then they want to collect them all because there are so many different colors and the care is essentially the same for most of them so that's kind of this area is just some little goobers mixed in with some of our oddity stuff that we really enjoy right here is our um, blended soil mixing station we do help people if you get a plant here and you want to go ahead and pot it we go ahead and do that for you but we have a variety of different soils and additives to make sure that whatever soil you're getting is going to fit your plant well. Because, you know, succulents and, and philodendron, all these ficus, and everybody has their specific little wants and needs. So in this way, we can kind of show people what they need to use and mix it up and help them blend it and then pot it. Um, yeah. So Taylor, on the on the soil mixing, I think that that's really fascinating to to know that these plants need a specific type of environment to thrive and live in. Um, right. what, are, what are the most common house plants, starting with like your snake plant, your ivies, and stuff like that? What kind of soils do they need to thrive? Most of the time, it's just a really well mixed standard potting soil. Okay. Um, yeah, usually it's um, peat moss is a really common foundation, like in almost all house plant starting mixes and it's 
it's a great product because it holds a lot of moisture, um, but if it holds too much moisture for the plant, they'll add in perlite, those little white rocks you see in soil mixes. Um, they're really light and fluffy and they get uh, more draining for plants that want to be on the drier side. Um, so if it's more peat mossy and your plant doesn't love that, you can just add a little bit. So you can kind of like make it like a recipe, you know, like a pinch here and a pinch there. Um, but we also kind of change it up sometimes. Like we use cocoa coir in our mix um, because it's a good alternative to pea. It's a little more sustainable. Um, it's a byproduct of the coconut industry. So the husks are shredded and it's just a good alternative. It's readily available. And um, so our mixing station has a little bit of all that. So you can kind of like, yeah, mix it together like a little soup and recipe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Most of them start with a pretty standard potting mix. Um, we usually use peat or cocoa, worm castings, perlite, that kind of thing, because you want to go, um, we don't usually use a ton of fertilizer. And if we do, we want it to be organic and because it's in your house, your kids are in it, your pets are in it. So you want to try to use stuff that's a little bit more natural. So there's things like worm castings and stuff that are really light, easy fertilizer that if your kid goes to eat your dirt, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, which happens. It happens <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so that's kind of what we start with. And then we add and subtract whatever we need to to pitch plant. I love it. And I love that you're thinking about the environment in which the plant's living and protecting the people in the home. I think that that's fantastic. So thank you for letting me interrupt you there. I know you yeah. want to show us no something else. So go sure. ahead. Sure. Wow. And then this kind of starts the run into our main area um, of available retail plants. Some of them back here are often held or we're using them for a project or we have something coming up that we know that we're gonna hold a couple plants for. So when people come back here, this is not always off limits, but it's sometimes kind of reserved. Right here, this run along here is going to be stuff that is more is available and um, we kind of walk people through different lighting needs and stuff for different plants. So really that's the main question whenever we're, we have somebody come in, whether they're a really experienced plant person or if they're totally brand new. The first couple of questions we have are, you know, what kind of lighting do you have? What kind of maintenance do you want to do? Like, do you want to be able to set it and forget it? Are there considerations for cats or animals or kids? Like, do we need to avoid toxic things? That sort of thing. Um, so then we kind of just like walk people through the variety of different choices. So you come through here and these are all nice and pretty. And then this is into our main room. Um, so Taylor, so, have we passed any of your personal favorite plants? Yeah, but we're not turning around. I don't think at this point, there's a giant, if you want to, there's a giant Salome that we have who's, um, fingers are like bigger than your face. I'll show you. She's one of my girls. Why do you like this plant so much? Because she's huge and she's so forgiving and um, she's just one of those like you walk in and you're like what is that? And it's and it's, she's just you know she's she kind of a showstopper. Give her a bear hug and pull it up. She did. <laughs> let's, let's do some squats. I know. Uh -oh. She's a big girl. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, she's kind of large. That's beautiful. And in typical Texas fashion, no, bigger sometimes better. So, <laughs> love it. Yeah. I love it. So, what about Michael? Does Michael have a favorite plant? Get oh. with your best, right? Okay? Oh, man. This is a rabbit hole we could go down for a while. But Michael's a tree guy. Yeah, I think I'm more of a tree guy. I. Yeah got into bonsai a while back and went down a real kind of collecting habit of collecting different trees for bonsai and yeah so that that's probably where more where my um preference is and those tend to be more like outdoor trees there are some good trees for indoor bonsai but they're more like tropical trees that are brought indoors but um i prefer like a really hardy texas tree like an elm or an oak or something that you can trained to look like a deciduous tree that could be in your backyard but it's a it's a bonsai by all intents and purpose but um it's not really meant to be a bonsai like in traditional japanese um craft but it's uh, just the texas version if you want to apply that art form to any tree species it's, it's one of my favorites is like big old elm trees so that's, that's awesome. into it from the art yeah 
Mm -hmm. that, in fact, one of one of the questions that Claudia sent over to us is, uh, it, in fact, it's not even a question. It just says, talk bonsai and don't yeah. stop. <laughs> this is, all the things. Yeah, this is where I'm like, okay, Taylor, yeah, step yeah, back. Uh, excuse right. me, this is my Yeah, let's talk bonsai. <laughs> stop. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we hope to carry more bonsai now that we, we have an outdoor area that was recently fenced off. So we have kind of a little patio that we can leave trees out all night and healthily kind of water them as outdoor plants. So we'll stock more of that as the summer progresses and into the fall. And um, yeah, it's the art form can be applied to a lot of different species. So you usually see like a traditional like um, juniper, like these little guys that just put here on. Um, so a little juniper tree that you might buy in a little pot and train with kind of like a little slanting style is how a lot of people start. Um, but the art form can be applied to any woody species or shrub or tree. And um, it's, it's more of an art form that's applied to a plant. It's not necessarily a specific species. That's one of the most popular um, workshops we had planned whenever we, a year ago, when we were thinking this was going to be a workshop and event space and things like that, people were totally into the bonsai thing because that was interesting and exciting and so I think that's one of those things that will come back around that'll be really popular really fun. We get asked about it a lot. We do. <laughs> so okay we didn't get to touch much on that and how you guys transitioned when COVID hit. Tell us a little bit more about how you managed to survive during this pandemic. Well, we got lucky. We got lucky. We got real lucky. Because it wasn't, yeah. um, you know, it wasn't like normal times. Like it would have been cool to have opened in normal times and see what the plant trend was like without COVID. But um, the plant trend stayed pretty steady because people were home and, you know, they needed new babies and there was not very many dogs to adopt anymore. So they were like, mm -hmm. okay, I guess I'll do plants. And um, yeah, we kept it really safe in the beginning, like masks and outdoors. And we still to this day shop one at a time, which I think our patrons really appreciate they wear masks and line up out the door and they just take turns and it's you know we're in a very small space so I think they appreciate that too like we have some uh, customers who are um, immune, compromised. immune compromised and so you know they get to come in and have you know 10 minutes alone to ask Taylor a bunch of questions and it's it's we really appreciate that like funneling them through that one at a time because of safety but also they get they get yeah, some private personal. plant time yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so we got lucky kind of in that way yeah and whenever you know whenever it all switched from events to primarily retail yes the plant game totally jumped through the roof everybody knows everybody got super into that and baking you know and uh we were fortunate to be in one of those businesses that was in demand so we got very lucky in that regard and in another we just worked really hard to maintain a consistent you know, force and we we had flowers at the time that we were doing just honor system flowers outside and that sort of thing, cut flowers and that sort of thing. And um, people were really into it because they really wanted to support but wanted to be very careful. And we were on the same page, and so it was just a game of pivoting. It's, that's what it's been this whole time for every business. Everyone's in the same boat, you know, trying to figure out how to make it work the best. And and we yeah, we got very lucky. In some yeah. ways, it was like almost nice that we didn't have a business that was five years into a business plan and then pivoting. Like we were literally opening the doors right. as COVID was shutting down places. So it was really easy to change up a business model that hadn't even been implemented. So it was kind of fun to be like, okay, well, we hadn't even started doing it this way. So we might as well do it this way. So it would have been harder. I think if we were two years in and had to totally change our model, but we just, right. We just yeah. adapted. So it was, it was good. I love it. And you guys, you guys are true creatives and you've used your creativity in every facet of life at this point, it seems like, right? Trying to figure this out and navigate things. So we have a specific question about a rattlesnake plant. Now, I don't even know what this is. Do you have a rattlesnake plant? You can, she does, of course she does. All right, so here's your question. The rattlesnake plant is starting. Oh yes, that is so cool looking. Okay, it's starting to form brown spots on a couple of leaves. Is this more likely a sunlight or watering issue? Any other tips on keeping it healthy? So Calathea as a whole family, they don't love a ton of direct light. So if the tips and the edges are what's getting brown, sometimes that's an indicator of too much light or being too close to a window and it's like literally a sunburn. Um, they're pretty tender little babies. 
Another thing is if it's rolled up like a taco, then that indicates that that kind of tells you that it's too dry in your, your air is. So if you can let it go on a field trip with you to a sweaty bathroom to get your steam, <laughs> that's where they want to be, right? They're very tropical. Uh, if that browning is happening within the leaf, that can sometimes mean that there's some root rot, but I would, so one thing to check is if it's not in its nursery pot anymore, make sure that the roots are not soggy. Um, those are, that's about it for what can happen to a Calathea because we're past the cold, we're past anything like that. So watch the sun, not too much sun and, and keep them kind of humid. And if it keeps happening, send me a picture to Truly Studio on Instagram. And I'm a visual because I'm a visual person too. Did you see that casual plug she just did? Truly <laughs> Studio on Instagram. I like follow. it. I'm a follower. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, subscribe, like, follow. Guys, I have to tell our audience that just as a personal testimony, when I got to meet you the first time about a month ago, when we stopped by the studio to meet you and talk about doing this, um, I was blown away, number one, by... Um, like just the wealth of knowledge that you have. And you went from being a, a high school teacher and coach to now owning a plant studio and and the language you were using to describe these things. I'm going, wait a minute, when did you have time to learn this? You've got small kids at home. How did you make this transition? Two things. I've killed a lot of plants. Um, confession. Confession of a plant shop owner. I have killed them. Uh, and number two is not intentionally, not intentionally no. Um, but number two is that there's so much knowledge out there now. And I think the access to different, really knowledgeable YouTubers, to be honest with you, has changed the game because there are people who are horticulturists by trade and they are getting out there and pushing their information out there. And if you are patient and willing to sit and learn something new, even if it's out of your standard wheelhouse before, there's the, the beauty of being like a lifelong learner is like you're never done. And there's so much information out there that if you get yourself pigeonholed, you don't get that chance. So when we opened this studio and we started with, you know, the events and that sort of thing, and then when we did have to pivot to more of the retail and having more intense plant knowledge, we both just dove in. But that's not to say we have a pretty decent background in growing because we grew vegetables and herbs and we sold at the community market and we've, we've done that stuff forever. Switching to indoor houseplants was a little different because there's different tricks and tips and things you got to kind of watch. Um, but ever since we've known each other, we've been growing things. And sometimes you don't know the answer to something and like quite often we'll be with the customer and they ask the question and we're like let's look it up so that's fun too that you can bring them along with you like let's look it up together so it feels a little silly at first like consulting google when you're supposed to be the expert but sometimes you don't know and that's fine and right. um the, the access to knowledge is kind of you know 21st century right so you can bring them along and then i think right. they feel more confident too that if they have a problem on their own they can ask us but they can also just but we're human and we know we don't know everything. So we're happy to do research with people. Yeah. I love that. Well, guys, I cannot believe we're almost halfway through, a little over halfway through this episode. And we still haven't even talked terrariums. We haven't talked about the big event coming up on May 1st. We we haven't looked at the tattoo space or talked tattoos. We've got so much to cover. Okay. So where do you want to start? Speed, Rapid speed, fire. speed round. Rapid fire. Terrarium. Cool. Let's start with terrarium. Cool. <laughs> Let's do terrarium. Let's do terrarium. And if you want to, I can kind of be building one and talking through it. And you're welcome to ask questions and stuff while I'm doing that. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right. So the space that um, Taylor is standing in front of is a, is a workshop area. And you can see on the bottom shelf there, there are some small, I'm talking so they can't see actually. Taylor, you tell them what is in front of you there. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. So this is the terrarium bar. It's a build your own terrarium um, situation. So basically you start with a, the choice of your glass size and that kind of, that kind of you know, dictates what you can do with it. Um, in here, we have three different price points. It includes X number of plants and then all the top dressing is included in that as well. We don't really nickel and dime it. We just kind of work our way up. So you start with glass. 
the most important thing to remember about a terrarium is that there is no drainage hole. So you have to work through some steps and we kind of go from left to right up here because I am an English major and so that's how you do things. And uh, so you start out and when you come in, we basically set you up with a little cafeteria tray full of doodads and fruit fruits and you set out to get really dirty. It's so, kind of like a buffet for plant craft, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like an apothecary meets plant person. Totally. You know? People come in and they're like, uh, can I just rebuild this in my bedroom? <laughs> Where did you get them? Yes. No, you cannot. <laughs> okay, so Taylor, if, if someone wanted to book a party and bring some friends over and do a happy hour, tell us a little bit about what that entails. So basically that looks like just um, giving me a holler. It's a real official process. Um, if we, we do book them outside of business hours sometimes for a large enough group, but basically it's just the same price as the regular terrarium. And we have these really fantastic foils outside and seating for about 20 max um, with everybody spread really far apart. And we are BYOB when food friendly. So if you wanted to, you could always, you know, grab a pizza and a beer and scuttlebutt yourself on up here and do some plants. Um, we originally thought we originally thought it would be more like um, appointment based or like mm -hmm. classes that were guided, but the process is really more like do it yourself, jump in. And we've really enjoyed like people being able to drop into the classes as more of like a come when you're ready type thing. And with just a few minutes of here's how you do it, go for it. Like getting, right. getting your hands dirty is the best way to get into it, honestly. Right. I love it. And the, the steps are very straightforward, really. So once you get past a couple of little essential things, um, the top dressing, the mosses, all that kind of stuff is purely decorative. So that's where people really get to kind of expand their creativity and make it however they want to. We'll have people that, you know, will stick with a succulent and bones and, and you know, more dry, arid looking sort of terrarium. We'll have people make really beachy themed ones and put a bunch of sand and they got like a little drink umbrella they tuck in, you know, things like that. So. The options are really varied whenever you start looking at them. So we'll have people that'll come up and do, you know, one every couple of weeks. And they're like, all right, what do you have now? So we always are bringing in new rocks and stuff to kind of make it fun and exciting. That sort of thing. That's awesome. So tell us what you chose to put in your terrarium. So basically what I started with is I prefer foliage plants. They tend to do a little bit better. Um, I chose a palm, an aluminum plant, and a petonia. In, the, in this open face girl, three plants is really kind of nice because it fills out the space, especially once you start putting everything else in it, but it doesn't choke them out. So you don't have to worry about them getting a little bit too large eventually. Yeah, so if you are coming in to just pick one up to take one, like you want to gift it to somebody, we do have some that are already pre-set up and they do have you know, the rocks and the soil and everything sort of ready to go. And then you just pick the plants that you want to add to it. Um, or you can come build it out in person either way. Those would be awesome Mother's Day gifts. I love that. We teamed up with uh, Golden Boy Coffee actually last year and we did a Mother's Day package where they did a, a funky little coffee blend and I think an alcoholic drink and then a pie and a terrarium. It was a whole little kit. And it was awesome. It was super great. So I, yes, you could absolutely do that. I love that. Gifts for anything, really, not just Mother's Day. My goodness. I hope my husband's watching. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, so you start out with like a couple little plants and stuff. And then all, when you add in just a few little things, like some, you know, moss and a couple little rocks and, you know, some funky little, you know, pine cones and things like that, sorry. Um, I'm not very good at the technology stuff either. Kind of a grandma. Um, You're doing a great job. Now you can even just stop there and like more is less, you know, less is more. <laughs> or you can take it and just go crazy town and end up with jaw bones and teeth and just, you know, you can make it what you want and that's kind of the beauty of it. Each one can be different. 
Yeah. Love that. That is so much fun. Oh my gosh. I cannot yeah. wait until we can get some friends together and get in there and, and build our own terrariums. And yeah, it's pretty fun. It's going to be so much fun. All right. So you guys have a big event coming up on May 1st. Can you tell us a little bit about the block party? So it's going to be a little bit of like a craft fair, maker fair sort of deal. Um, we have invited, well, we took applications for um, people who wanted to come pop up out here. So we'll, vendors, um, we'll close off the parking lot like we did for a big plant and seed swap we had uh, about a month ago. And it was incredible. Everyone, we are still requiring masks, even though everyone's outside, it's just going to be tight quarters. So everyone needs to feel more comfortable. Um, so masks are still required, but people can kind of go around and visit these other vendors. It's primarily like boho, vintage style stuff that we can totally work into the plants and just kind of an all over aesthetic. Um, and we're really excited. That'll be May 1st and it'll be from 12 to four because some of our vendors also are gonna be at the Denton Community Market and we did not wanna compete um, with that market either because they're doing a seller job too. So we wanted to kind of just play after that. So maybe once people go to the market, get all their cool stuff over there, pop over here, get some more cool stuff here, go that route. I love it. Okay. And, and remind everybody what your Instagram handle is. So that way they can follow you guys if they haven't already done so. Plug, plug, True Leaf Studio. Everything's under True Leaf Studio, either on Facebook, Instagram, email, TikTok. our website, <laughs> TikTok for the youngins. <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> All right, Michael, tell us about your art. Um... Which part? No, kidding. <laughs> let's, let's start with the ink on your arms and how that all ties into something you do for a living as well. Yeah, I um, apprenticed the tattoo six years ago. And, um, you know, I start, you know, I was in drawing and painting classes in college and kind of imagined some career doing art in general. And I think I always kind of kept it really open, like uh, design, graphic design, painting. Like, I think artists these days understand the, like, the more multifarious you can be, the more successful you can be. So tattooing to me was like just plugging in another medium. Um, and so the apprenticeship, apprenticeships in general are always pretty intense, but um, you know, you kind of drop everything for a while and focus on learning that one craft. And so that kind of immersion learning was cool. It was almost like, in some ways I thought of it like my grad school, cause I didn't end up going to uh, my grad, um, but five years of being at a shop, learning from my mentor, um, my shop that I was at was really, uh, well-known and their artists were all really experienced. So it was cool to learn from them and just be immersed and like thrown into it. It happened pretty quick, honestly, but, um, it's cool. It, like my clients are all really awesome and it's, it's cool to share that art with people in such a weird and intimate way. Um, it's unlike any other art where you are alone in your studio making, and then you might go to a gallery show or meet collectors and share and sell your work. Um, it's a whole different thing to like have them literally there with you while you make it, but also participants. So it's unlike any other art form in that way. So it, it was it was really fun and interesting. Absolutely, that makes perfect sense, and that's that's a really special uh, gift that you have there. And the fact that people can enjoy your artwork for their entire life is is really remarkable too. So what what are your how would you describe your style, and what what is your preference? Yeah, so um, I like to just lump all of the content I like to tattoo into a big kind of plant nature category. Um, I kind of think of it, it like if it looked good in a natural history museum, it would probably look pretty good as a tattoo composition. Um, so just arranging, you know, bones and sticks and plants and a lot of flowers. Um, that's been fun for me because it's, it's what I would have drawn anyway if I were just doodling. Um, so it comes natural drawing wise, but then my clients get to wear something around that is thin black work lines. They hold up really well over time, but it's really detailed still. Um, so you could maybe relate it to like a woodcut print or an ink drawing because um, it's mostly black lines and no color. But um, yeah, the style I think is maybe line work or detail or shape. It's, mm -hmm. it's not very shaded or colored. It's a lot of line work. Mm -hmm. I love it. So how far out are you booking? And if someone's interested in booking a consult with you or a session, let them know how to do that and, and what the timeline's like. Yeah, so through my website, michaelbalesart.com uh, and my Instagram, michaelbalesart, you can inquire and fill out a form. Um, that contact form kind of gives us all the information about the piece. And um, 
you might be kind of put through our emailing and answering system for a couple of months um, when we just process a lot of the inquiries that we get. Um, so your total wait time, I don't know, might be somewhere between three to six months or more. Um, but I feel really fortunate that I have a lot of people asking about tattoos and wanting to get tattooed. So unfortunately, not everyone and not every project comes through. But um, we try to waitlist people before they kind of get their consult. So by the time you get a consult, you're kind of a month or two away from an appointment. Um, but that's the process is kind of inquiring and getting an email back and us apologetically saying thank you for waiting. Um, but the people who are patient, it's it's a real it's a real humbling thing that they wait and we really appreciate. By the time they do get in, it's really cool because they're prepared, they've saved, they're wa they've waited, and it's a real fun high five moment at the end of that when they've waited for six months. So it might not be that long for everyone, but if you do wait, I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I'm and it's scheduling just, agent. Taylor handles all my emails and stuff. It's very so. often a little longer than that, but mm -hmm. we have incredible clients, so we're 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 very fortunate. Yeah, and we love you all. And I'm sorry if I haven't emailed you back. Yeah, she's like, if you're waiting on an email, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Kind of didn't know what you're doing after this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Frantically email. And the great thing about waiting is now you know that that client is really committed to that piece of art and yeah. it, it makes perfect sense. I think it's it's well worth the wait. You guys are fantastic. So even though things might be a little dirty up at the front of the shop, Michael, you can guarantee it has a very clean space in the back. And we got to look at it while we were there a couple of days ago. I won't make you guys roll back there today right now, but sure. just trust me here. He's got a great space. It's very clean, yeah. well we, lit. We treat it like a kind of like a mad scientist laboratory in the back where it's sterile, no stainless steel, anything. don't touch anything. <laughs> and then like the plants are up front. So, yeah. They're all up here. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, I've got a few more questions for you guys. So okay. let's talk succulents for a second. They are insanely popular right now. Um, I I don't mean to brag, but I've managed to kill a lot of them. And I thought that you couldn't kill these guys, right? I've overwatered them. I've talked to them too much. It's I finally figured out the soil and the drainage and you know how to baby them a little bit better. But what are your professional tips and tricks that you can offer to our audience to take care of succulents? Go ahead. Well, succulents are straight from hell. So um, that's, that's how she starts everybody. the conversation with that's everybody. That's why I tell everybody. But here's the deal. I am a classic lover of plants, right? So I like to water and I like to look at them. I like to talk to them. I like to, you know, and so, um, so I know they want, they're so beautiful, but I have overwatered a succulent myself because they do want to live in such a harsh environment and they only want to be bottom watered very irregularly and I am a very like structured I like to water you on the week person so for me succulents are also a bit of a struggle sometimes I do better with foliage plants but there are people who are complete opposites of me and very much struggle with foliage plants and rock out on succulents and have a huge collection of them because maybe they have a really great outside space um the truth of the matter is Succulents want all the sun you can throw at them and very little water. So if you have that environment where it's going to be very dry and you can give them direct sunlight, then they're great. But if you are a person who likes to water. Yeah. And if you, if you give them like the worst case scenario, like put them in a dark office and water them every day, it's right. like a death sentence for a, a plant that is, you know, native to arid regions and wants to be next to a rock and sunny and sunny. So right. putting it in a dark spot and over watering is kind of like a, a double whammy for that poor little plant. I know, which sure. unfortunately, you know, a lot of people are given a succulent as their first plant, but not given the instruction. So they take, they get a succulent and they're like, okay, I like this thing. And then in two weeks it's dead and they feel like they can't do plants then, yeah. but they just maybe didn't have the right environment. So that's kind of what we try to avoid up here is like when someone comes in and says, this is my first plant. I want to be successful. I don't want to kill this thing. What can I do? That's why we always ask, like, what is your lighting like? And what kind of person are you? Do you like to water? Do you think you're going to forget about this thing? Like, where are we at on this? Because we want to find something that someone is going to be successful with and then be able to grow and expand on that instead of get one, it dies, and then they're heartbroken about it and don't try again. So 
That makes perfect sense. Uh, so thank you for all of that. Um, okay, I love this question because I've thought this many times. I like to try and resuscitate plants and bring them back to life. I, you know, I want to heal them all. But how do you know when it's time to just give up and call it what it is, <laughs> read the flat line and walk away, right? How, how do you know? Every plant's different. Um, some of them, they look totally dead, but they're a bulb. And so you get down in the soil and you realize that there's tubers and that like you can work with that. Some plants, you get down in the soil and the roots are totally mush and it smells funky and it, there's rot. Um, that is kind of when it's toast. Um, for your rattlesnake friend, um, Calathea, if these sweet little babies get all dried up and turn into prunes, she done, Jack. So, you know, it's every one of them is a little different. A lot of them are very hardy. They want to live. So even if you just kind of, what we normally tell people is like, get it out of its old soil, clip off all the old funky roots, get it into new soil and give it a light water. Um, that might save it. Yeah, and if you can propagate yeah. it, you know, like you might root rot a plant and you've lost the bottom half, but all the stalks are still alive. You can cut them, throw them in water and let a little root pop. And that might be a way to kind of clone your plant. Um, so it's the same plant, same biology, but just not starting from roots. You got to start over, but yeah. that's a fun way to revive or recover a lost plant. But yeah. um, not all plants uh, propagate that way, but that's a fun way to kind of recover. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's just time to move on to like, um, <laughs> it's sweet that people like, right. um, want to humanize or like, um, you know, love their plants because a lot of plant people are caring, nurturing individuals. Mm -hmm. That's why they're taking this little baby home. Um, but it's kind of also, um, you realize that in nature plants live and die in a constant cycle. So a plant dying, you know, it might've dropped seeds and put out runners. And so you get all sad about it dying, but some plants have a cycle that, you know, you don't always get to leave them alive forever. So um, you might also have a plant that's like 10 years old or your grandma had and she gives it to you and you keep it alive for another 20 years. So don't quit. Just come in and buy another plant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and just bring it into Taylor and Michael. They'll tell you yeah. exactly. If, to if it's toast, we'll be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. I love that. Yeah. So, okay. Another great question. Would you recommend a good house plant that's puppy friendly? Uh, dogs don't tend to mess with plants as much as cats do. Okay. Um, there are a few that are still toxic regardless. So I would avoid, um, rubber trees and ZZ plants. I would avoid peace lilies. I would avoid whole dracaenas. There's a few of them that are more toxic than others, but by toxic, it's itchy mouth, gastrointestinal issues, that kind of thing. It's not necessarily straight to a vet. It's just like the dog's going to be puny for a little bit. Um, Cat, yeah. Cats tend to be more curious and like mm -hmm. leafy kind of mess, you know, they'll mess with leafy plants out of curiosity and then nibble on it because it feels good and then they get right. sick. So cats, I think you might want to watch more out careful. for more, um, but the ASPCA and other animal resources online have really good information and it's pretty well known which plants are really bad for animals and which ones are safe. So there's a lot of, again, really good information online if you're curious. That's and when people come in, they usually tell me, like, okay, I've got a cat. What can I have? And we're, we're pretty good about, you know, if we're not sure, we'll look it up too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes great sense. Well, guys, we are just about done here. And I hate to wrap it up because you're, you're okay. both just such a wealth of knowledge and information. And I can't thank you enough for your time today and sharing your gifts with us and your talents. Yeah. And um, guys, I can't, urge you enough to support our small businesses, get out to True Leaf, visit them, go get some food from down the street and drinks at East Side Oak Street, whatever, bring them back, yeah. have a little get together with your friends yeah. safely. Yeah. Um, I, I, we're so proud of you guys. And so once again, just proof that UNC turns out some really great people and our, our people are resilient and smart and creative and <laughs> you guys just keep doing it. All right. So thank you again, Taylor and Michael. We appreciate you. And I thank you guys. thanks guys. Appreciate y'all. Yeah. Thank Bye you now. so much. Thanks guys. Um, thanks all of you for joining us for this awesome tour. If you want to learn more, you can follow True Leaf Studio and Michael Bales Art on Instagram. And Definitely head over to the shop on Locust Street here in Denton to find the plant of your dream and use the code UNT alumni for 10% off your purchase. Now is your last chance to check out the chat function here in Zoom and fill out this week's survey. 
uh, you will be entered to win a great UNT prize pack that I will mail to you. Uh, for our next episode on Thursday, April 22nd, we're bringing back live music. We'll have alumnus Quentin Moore and his band of the Dax Tones, which includes several UNT alumni playing funk favorites and tunes from their new album. We had an absolute blast all of our previous live concerts, so I hope you'll join us for another fun evening of music. To register, just check out the chat function here right now, or go to our website, untalumni.com slash alumni live to register. Finally, have you tried our new UNT white wine? It's made by UNT alumnus John Matthews at his winery right here in Texas, and a portion of every sale goes toward helping our students through scholarships. Learn more at untalumni.com slash alumni dash wine. Thank you for being here with us today, and we hope we'll see you on April 22nd. Go Mean Green. Go Mean Green. <laughs> <laughs>